Welcome to this lecture on the development of locomotion. I thank Fiorenzo Conti and the Board of Directors of the Italian Physiological Society for giving me the opportunity to present. How do the rudimentary movements of an infant evolve in the sophisticated movements of the adult? This question is in some sense a sort of holy grail in neuroscience. New motor skills are the most dramatic and observable changes in the first year of a child. Parents are always interested in the motor milestones of their babies. They want to know when their child will sit up or crawl or walk. Scientists may want to know whether a given motor behavior is innate or learned, whether it is determined by the genes or the environment. That is the role of nature versus nurture. Clinicians must determine whether the motor behavior of a child is normal or pathological. We may not be able to answer all these questions, but we want to know the sequence of developmental processes. So I will first describe the main embryological steps leading to the assembly of spinal motor circuits I will then consider the early spontaneous movements, reflex stepping of newborns, independent walking of toddlers, further locomotor development till adolescence, and finally I will consider cerebral palsy, the most common disorder of motor development. Walking is such an automatic task that we often neglect its complexity. Every time we take a step, we use about 50 muscles in each leg to counteract the ground reaction forces and propel the body forwards. In addition, trunk and upper limb muscles are involved for postural balance and interlimb coordination. This animation shows only a small subset of all the muscles involved. Muscle activation requires continuous electrochemical activity at several levels of the nervous system, with waves of excitation in tens of thousands of motor neurons of the spinal cord. These are reflected in the spatiotemporal maps of motor neuron activity and the electromyographic activity recorded from the muscles. Spinal motor neurons receive sensory feedback from skin, tendon, muscle, joint receptors, and are subject to descending signals from multiple regions of the brain. Spinal motor neurons activate the muscles alternatively for the left and right legs. What the described refers to adult locomotion, but how does it develop? I first summarize the main embryological steps leading to the formation of the nervous system. After the initial cell divisions of the zygote, the blastocyst has an inner cell mass that differentiates in endoderm, mesoderm, and ectoderm during gastrulation. Most of the ectoderm becomes the skin, but the narrow central strip becomes the neural plate and then the neural tube. The differentiation of the neural plate depends on signals secreted by the organizer region. These signals include noggin, cording, and folistatin. They inhibit BMP, the bone morphogenetic protein. Wind and fibroblast growth factor, FGF, are additional inductive signals. The cells of the neural tube become specified along both the rostrocaudal and the dorsoventral axis, and the gradients of signaling molecules. For instance, the level of retinoic acid RA delineates the boundary between different regions of the central nervous system. Position and pattern of neurons along the rostrocaudal axis of the spinal cord are guided by the release of retinoic acid RA from the somites, and along the dorsoventral axis by sonic hedgehog SHH from the notochord and floor plate, and BMPTGF, the transforming growth factor beta from the roof plate. During development, 
the notochord is replaced by the vertebral column in vertebrates. Motoneurons are normally induced in the ventral spinal cord. However, by grafting the notochord dorsally, one can induce motoneurons in the dorsal spinal cord. The ventral spinal cord is divided in five progenitor domains, P0 to P3 and premotoneuron, which give rise to the adult V0 to V3 interneurons and motoneurons. The specification of each cell type depends on the combined action of different transcription factors, which in turn are expressed as a function of the dorsoventral gradients of SHH and BMP TGF. Opposing concentration gradients of retinoic acid RA and fibroblast growth factor FGF elicit expression of specific Hox genes along the rostrocaudal axis of the spinal cord. Cross-repressive interactions between different Hox proteins shape the character of different regions, cervical, brachial, thoracic, or lumbar. They create compartments of motoneurons into specialized columns innervating different muscle groups, such as Foley muscles, or hindly muscles. The fully transparent embryo of the zebrafish is ideal to image development directly. Using light sheet microscopy, Philip Keller and his group at Janilia described neurogenesis and the emergence of coordinated neuronal activity during gastrulation. They showed the neuroprogenitor cells migrate toward the midline and form the neural plate, which then extends longitudinally along the future body axis to form the neural tube. Motor neurons are the first to differentiate and become active in the spinal circuits, as shown by calcium imaging. Few sparse motor neurons start firing then groups of motoneurons merge together, become progressively synchronized on each side of the spinal cord, and finally alternate between the left and right sides. Once the motoneurons innervate the muscles, the fish starts moving the tail. This developmental sequence underlies the locomotor behavior of all vertebrates, whether it is swimming in fishes, flying birds, or walking mammals. Neurogenesis of different cell types involves special and temporal segregation during embryonic development. As I said, the motoneurons are the first to differentiate in the ventral spinal cord. Next, Premotor interneurons in the dorsal spinal cord differentiate. First, those synapsing on flexor motor neurons, then those synapsing on extensor motor neurons, despite both derived from common progenitor domains. In humans, the nervous system begins to develop during the third week postmenstrual age of gestation. Limb buds emerge during the fourth week. Differentiation of myotomes, which develop into skeletal muscles, begins at week five. At this time, the heart starts pulsating. Sensory motor connections develop, and the first reflex circuits are established centrally. The first local movements can be recorded with ultrasounds at seven, eight weeks when the baby is as small as a bean. Local movements then evolve in general movements of the body. Here, magnetic resonance imaging shows kiki movements at different stages of gestation. Spontaneous movements such as these persist throughout gestation until several months after birth. It is important to remark that embryonic and fetal motility 
is necessary for the correct development of several organs, including the nervous system, the muscles, tendons, joints, bones, and lungs. Diminished or absent movements are associated with severe malformations and functional disorders, often incompatible with survival. The clinical syndrome is called fetal echinacea deformation sequence. We have been able to record non-invasively the activity of individual spinal motor neurons in Kiki newborns. We used high-density electrodes in collaboration with Alessandro Del Vecchio and Dario Farina. This is the activity of six motor neurons during a fast flexion of the leg and foot. Below, you see the spikes of the motor neurons, above the leg movement. Spinal motor neurons of newborns discharge highly synchronous action potentials. This is quantified by the temporal cross correlation and the coherence in the frequency domain, the delta band at 0 to 5 Hz. High synchrony compensates for the slow contraction times of neonatal muscles and is responsible for fast movements. Motoneuron synchronization is due to common synaptic inputs from premotor interneurons of the central pattern generators and from afferent feedback. Contribution to synchronization also comes from electrical gap junctions between motoneurons. Each fiber of mature muscles is innervated by a single motor axon, but this is not so in newborns. Here we see the first days of postnatal development of neuromuscular synapses in rodents. At postnatal day six, several intertwined motor axons, green in the slide, terminate over clusters of postsynaptic acetylcholine receptors, red. The asterisks denote end plates innervated by more than one axon. At day 14, virtually all synapses are innervated by a single axon. There is a correlation between the changes in motor neuron synchrony, the presence of gap junctions, and muscle innervation. At first, the activity of motor neurons is strongly synchronous. There are extensive gap junctions and polyinnervation of muscle fibers. Then synchronous activity decreases, and so do gap junctions and polyinnervation. Loss of temporally correlated activity allows the postsynaptic muscle fiber to discriminate between its inputs, triggering synaptic competition that leads to single innervation. An increasing amount of synaptic inputs becomes focused on fewer target cells. Notice that gap junctions also couple muscle fibers initially, and then disappear as neuromuscular transmission matures. Infants generate spontaneous movements for several months after birth. These movements are erratic, chaotic, apparently purposeless. However, the existence of an underlying structure can be revealed with different methods. Kanazawa and colleagues in Tokyo describe maps of information flow among movements and proprioception throughout the body. They found that the sensory motor interactions fluctuate at discrete times. The presence of structure in neonatal movements implies that they are built from modular components just as a complex object is built starting from simpler elements. In a modular system, the process can be reversed, and the individual modules are recovered by decomposition. Stan Grillner and Emilio Bizzi pioneered the application of these concepts to the field of motor control. We apply these concepts to discover the structure underlying neonate movements. Specifically, we apply factor analysis to the recorded electromyographic activity, and we describe the variability of muscle activity in terms of a few basic patterns and their weights, 
or muscle synergies. Here, different colors identify the spatiotemporal modules of the neuromuscular commands. We recorded the electrical activity of multiple lower limb muscles during kicking newborns. This activity is extremely variable from one woman to the next, from one child to the other one. However, all activity can be factorized into common waveforms or temporal activation patterns that resemble those of adult walking. In contrast with adults, however, the activation patterns of a kick in newborns are not associated with stable muscle synergies. In other words, each time a pattern is activated, it is associated with a different combination of muscles. And this explains the variable profiles of muscle activity shown on the left of the slide. In the lab of the late Tom Jessel at Columbia, the activation patterns of motor neurons have been studied in the isolated spinal cord of neonatal mice. Motor neurons are made to fire by using glutamate receptor agonists. Here, the spike counts for these motor neurons over 90 seconds are plotted over the fictive locomotor cycle. Despite variability, each neuron has a preferred phase tuning relative to the locomotor cycle, the red arrows. And this is the map of 1,000 motor neurons in the lumbar segments L2 to L6 of the spinal cord. Each motor neuron is color-coded based on the phase tuning. When they factorize the fire rates of all recorded motor neurons, they found that four temporal patterns explain most data variance. Strikingly, the patterns that they discovered are similar to those of human kicking neonates. Therefore, the basic modular organization of commands for locomotor-like activity is conserved in the evolution of vertebrates. In young infants, there is extensive co-activation of several muscles, including antagonists, during both spontaneous movements and reflexes. For instance, noxious stimuli evoke ipsilateral and contralateral flexion activity in newborns. We studied the responses to passive cyclic movements in infants aged between two weeks after birth and 12 months. We found that movement of one joint can evoke contralateral responses, the so-called irradiation of the responses to distant muscles. Irradiation typically decreases till disappearance with increasing age, but it may reappear with pathology. Co-activation of motor neurons may depend, at least in part, on the fact that GABA and glycin, which are inhibitory neurotransmitters in adults, are excitatory during early development. This is due to the initial absence of potassium chloride KCC2 exporter and the predominance of NKCC1 chloride importer. This leads to high intracellular concentration of chloride anions, their efflux after GABA release, and the neuron depolarization, the opposite of what occurs in adults. A switch of expression of the genes for glycine receptors occurs about six to nine months after birth. This is the time when co-activation of motor neurons switches to reciprocal inhibition. Spontaneous activity is ubiquitous in the developing nervous system. Work in animal models has shown that early motor activity facilitates the organization of neural circuits at both spinal and supraspinal levels. Spontaneous bouts of motor neuron activity contribute to motor neuron pathfinding, maturation of synapses, and development of pattern generating circuits. In addition, early motor activity drives neural bursts in the developing cortex. Here, in the newborn rat, 
Spontaneous muscle twitches trigger spindle bursts in the primary somatosensory cortex. These neural bursts, in turn, contribute to the formation of cortical somatotopic maps. The visual assessment of general movements pioneered by Heinz Precht provides important clues to diagnose disorders of motor development. On the left, spontaneous movements performed by a healthy baby. On the right, spontaneous movements in a very preterm child. The video frames are taken every quarter of a second. Normal movements on the left are continuously varying, allowing exploration of multiple motor solutions and calibration of the sensory motor map. By contrast, the abnormal movements of the preterm child on the right side are highly stereotypical. The video frames are virtually identical, giving the false impression that the infant hardly moves. Pediatricians can amaze the parents of a newborn by showing that their baby can walk. This is the stepping reflex. If neonates are partially supported in contact with the surface, they start stepping like automata. This behavior mainly depends on brainstem and spinal networks. Even an encephalic neonates can step, that is, neonates with the congenital absence of the brain, for instance, due to a deficiency of folic acid during gestation. Neonatal stepping involves limb hyperflexion and lacks many features of adult walk, such as plantigrade foot contact, low limb clearance from the ground, and smooth movement coordination. Infant stepping is highly variable in terms of the cycle duration and the phase coupling between the left and right legs. We recorded the electromyographic activity in multiple muscles during neonatal stepping. Rectified activity shows extensive coactivation of many muscles in neonates, in contrast with the fractionated muscle activation of adults. If we factorize the electromyographic activity of stepping neonates, we find two temporal activation patterns, one for limb extension during stance, and another one for limb flexion during swing. Adults show two additional patterns, one at heel strike and another one at foot lift off. Therefore, the neonatal nervous system can express different motor patterns. While kicking is associated with four activation patterns, reflex stepping shows only two activation patterns, but associated with stable muscle synergies. These different modular organization may reflect innate neural mechanisms, but it also depends on the sensory feedback from low receptors of the feet and legs. Since newborns carry part of their weight during stepping, but not during kicking the air. Human adults normally swing their arms during walking. This is due to a coupling between the cervical and lumbosacral spinal circuits. In a few neonates, we found the overt presence of alternating arm leg oscillations with a similar interlimb phase as seen in adults. If one blocks one leg, the neonate continues to step with the other leg. This shows that each leg is controlled independently at birth. When the leg is released, the baby resumes bilateral stepping. The relative independence between the two sides is evident in the electromyographic recordings for both bilateral and unilateral stepping. Sometimes the activity of the limb muscles is alternating between the two limbs, as in adult walking. At other times, however, the activity is synchronous between the two limbs. 
Automatic stepping on newborns is consistent with the idea that limb movements are controlled by central pattern generators located in the spinal cord. The organization of central pattern generators is relatively well understood in some mammalian species. The CPGs are driven by descending commands from the mesencephalic locomotor region, MLR, and the diencephalic locomotor region, DLR. In the spinal cord, there are multiple CPGs, each controlling the muscle synergists at one joint. The normal pattern of activity results from the interaction between different generators. In adults, flexor and extensor CPG on each side of the cord mutually inhibit each other, providing flexor extensor alternation. This mechanism is not mature yet in human neonates, where we find episodes of left-right muscle alternation and episodes of synchronous left-right activity, as well as episodes of flexor extensor alternation and episodes of flexor extensor coactivation. I mentioned earlier the different classes of spinal interneurons emerge embryologically from distinct progenitor domains. Each class of interneurons has a different function in the mature CPG. V0 and V3 are commissural interneurons that project their axons across the midline of the spinal cord. They coordinate the mature locomotor rhythm between the left and the right side. V1 and V2A interneurons mediate mutual inhibition between flexor and extensor generators on each side of the cord and contribute to rhythm and pattern generation. In black, we have glutamatergic excitatory interneurons. In purple, GABA glycine inhibitor interneurons. V1 includes Arantia cells and a subset of 1A inhibitor interneurons. As I mentioned earlier, glycine and GABA are excitatory during early development. Spinal CPGs generate rhythmic locomotion, but the signal to start moving comes from the brainstem. The connections between the brainstem and the spinal cord are modular. The neonatal mice the lateral paragigantocellular nucleus, LPGI, and the caudal ventrolateral reticular nucleus, CVL, contain glutamatergic neurons that initiate locomotion. These brainstem neurons project to spinal cord modules that transform the descending command in rhythmic locomotor activity. This follows a specific temporal sequence which involves an entry point in the spinal cord, an immediate executor module, a premotor module, and motor neurons. Reflex stepping generally decreases in the first few months of the birth. It is like a primitive reflex without any obvious function until children can support themselves by means of appropriate posture reactions. But posture development takes several months in children. This explains why they can walk alone without support only at about 12 months. There's wide inter-individual variability in the timing of the different motor milestone. This is shown by their wide normative ranges. Each child has his own or her own specific developmental trajectory. We found that the complexity of locomotor commands increases with age. We recorded children of different ages from birth till four years. We factorized, as before, the electromyographic activity of multiple muscles. And we found that there is a progressive increase of the number of neuromuscular modules, activation patterns, and muscle synergies with increasing age. However, there is considerable variability between children of the same age. The histograms 
depict the distribution of the number of modules in each age group. How does a child multiply the number of locomotive modules while growing? We don't know for sure, but one scheme is to split or fractionate the synergies. Stepping neonates show a great deal of muscle coactivation that decreases during development, resulting in fractionated muscle activations. For instance, synergy W1 on neonates splits in synergies I1 and I2 of preschoolers. Similarly, synergy W2 of neonates splits in synergies I3 and I4 of preschoolers. Splitting is driven by multiple factors. I mentioned the role of the switch from excitation to inhibition of motor neuron pools. In addition, splitting may depend on descending signals from a cortical tutor. The maturation of the corticospinal tract plays a critical role in the reorganization of the spinal locomotor networks. The corticospinal tract descends progressively in the spinal cord, reaching first the cervical cord and then the lumbosacral cord at 29 gestational weeks. Its development also depends on motor practice. If a child or an animal are prevented from using a limb during the critical period of development, corticospinal projections to the relevant motor neurons retract, and skilled movements involving the affected limb fail to develop. The arrival of descending inputs in the spinal cord accelerates the postnatal maturation of spinal motor neurons. With development, the amplitude and shape of action potentials change due to changes in several biophysical parameters, such as the membrane resistance and capacitance, and the maximum fire frequency increases. These changes occur earlier in cervical motor neurons than lumbar motor neurons, in parallel with the early arrival of descending pathways at cervical than lumbar cord. Although the corticospinal tract innervates the spinal cord before birth, its myelination occurs postnatally between one and two years of age. But the tract does not fully mature until adolescence. On the left, brain tractography obtained with magnetic resonance imaging shows the corticospinal tract in pink. On the right, the volume of corticospinal tract increases with age, reaching a plateau at about 15 years. Nadia Dominici and collaborators in Amsterdam found that in toddlers, the coherence between the electroencephalographic signals of sensory motor cortex and the electromyographic activity of leg muscles is present only for the new modules what they call supplementary, but not for the congenital ones. This is consistent with the hypothesis of a cortical tutor for the addition of new neuromuscular modules. Notice that coherence is found in the beta band, 13 to 30 Hz, which does not reflect force generation, but modulator influences of spinal networks. Of course, infant development involves not only neuromuscular changes, but also biomechanical and energetic changes. The first steps of a toddler are a memorable event for any parent, since they represent movement independence of the child. Learning to walk involves intensive exercise. This is the walking path of a 13-month-old during 10 minutes of individual play. In this amount of time, the toddler took about 300 steps and fell three times. Falls provide important feedback to tune the sensory motor coordination. Considering all the motor work performed by a toddler, it is not surprising that this is the time of life when we consume more metabolic energy per unit of body mass. 
There is another reason why toddlers consume more energy, and I'll come to it later. The first year of life is also the time of the largest increase in the brain. The brain of a one-year-old child weighs about one kilogram. That is 70% of the adult brain. By comparison, the body at one year weighs only about 15% of the adult. We consider the relationship between the developmental changes of the neuromuscular modules I described before and the parallel changes in limb mechanics. Different colors identify the temporal correspondence between the modules and the limb kinematics. The two activation patterns of neonates are sufficient for the planar covariation of thigh, shank, and foot motion, but the posture is flexed, the feet are lifted high during swing, and the heel-to-toe shift of pressure during stance is absent. In toddlers, the new patterns are timed at touchdown and liftoff, providing shear forces to decelerate and accelerate the body. In adults, the four patterns are accurately timed around the four critical events of the gait cycle, heel strike, weight acceptance, forward propulsion, and liftoff. The legs are kept much straighter than in children. The central pressure shifts smoothly from heel to toe. Some eight years ago, Nikolai Bernstein proposed that freezing the degrees of freedom of motor coordination facilitates learning a new task by reducing the size of the search space. We found this effect by studying different groups of people who step over flat surface of an obstacle on stairs, on an inclined surface, up or down. Adults change the phase relationship between the relative motion of lead segments as a function of the task. Toddlers, however, do not change the phase, and they use the same kinematic synergy in all conditions. So they freeze their kinematic degrees of freedom, presumably to learn the new motor task. A major mechanism to save energy during walking was discovered by Cavani and Margari in the 60s. This mechanism consists in oscillating the body over the supporting foot as an inverted pendulum. In this manner, there is an exchange between the gravitational potential energy and the forward kinetic energy of the central body mass. With this mechanism, adults save as much as 65% of energy at the optimal speed of about 5 km per hour. In toddlers, however, the mechanism is not fully functional, as shown by the low percentage of energy recovery. This may contribute to the high consumption of metabolic energy that I showed before for toddlers. However, just few months of walking experience allow improving considerably the mechanism. Mature locomotion is not reached until adolescence. This is shown by several features of walking, for instance, the interstride variability. We consider the body weight transfer from one limb to the other. During step-to-step -step transitions, the downward trajectory of the central body mass must be redirected to an upward trajectory. In adults, the minimum vertical velocity of central body mass occurs before the ground contact of the leading limb. The anticipated transition reduces the impact of the leading limb with the ground. However, in immature walking, the opposite occurs. The minimum vertical velocity occurs after foot contact. We found that the percentage of immature transitions is elevated in children, especially at higher walking speeds. It tends to decrease only in adolescence. I now briefly discuss cerebral palsy, which is the most common cause of motor disability in children. 
Cerebral palsy defines a group of permanent disorders that affect movement and may also involve sensory plus cognitive functions. It depends on non-progressive disturbances that occurred in the developing fetal or infant brain. The gait of a child with cerebral palsy is often characterized by spasticity, hyperreflexia, aberrant limb and posture coordination, such as toe walking. The impairment of descending signals on the spinal cord during a critical window motor development affects the maturation of the spinal circuits of locomotion. As a result, we observe that the spatiotemporal maps of activation of lumbar sacral motor neurons in children with cerebral palsy resemble those of much younger, typically developing infants, rather than those of children of the same age. Factorization of the electromyographic activity of leg muscles shows that children with cerebral palsy have fewer and wider neuromuscular modules than typically developing children of the same age. Apparently, the mechanisms leading to module splitting in normal development are not functional in cerebral palsy. So we have an important message. Since module splitting and major plastic changes occur during the first two years, rehabilitation of children with cerebral palsy should start during this critical developmental window to exploit transient neural plasticity. For many brain functions, it has been shown that after the closure of the critical window for plasticity, it is very difficult to repair errors in brain development. To sum up and conclude, I argued that locomotor circuits emerge from activity-dependent plasticity. First, motor modules are built by merging and synchronizing pools of motor neurons. Later, native motor modules split and generate new modules. Commands complexity increases, while variability decreases with age. Initial low complexity and high variability reflect immaturity, but they involve benefits because they simplify motor control, generalization, exploration during development. Modular organization applies to spontaneous movements and locomotion. Also other kinds of movements I did not discuss, such as reaching. I also showed that cerebral palsy is associated with impaired module splitting. I provided evidence for convergent evolution of the developmental principles, with examples in fishes, amphibians, birds, mammals. Conserved features coexist with evolutionary innovations in each animal species. For instance, the control of erect bipedal locomotion in humans. And this brings us to the end. So thank you for listening.